Welcome everyone to the March 2022 edition of Voices for the West, a webinar series brought to you by Advocates for the West. My name is Will Shoemaker and I am Director of Communications and Engagement at Advocates for the West. We're honored to be joined tonight by Brooke Hess, Danielle Katz, and Stephen Pfeiffer, along with Advocates for the West staff attorney, Andrew Missel. The title of tonight's webinar is The Grand Salmon Source to Sea Journey at the Confluence of Conservation and Adventure. As you may be able to see from my background, my wife's in my gear room doubles as my office. Uh, so adventure is a big part of our lives, as I'm sure it is the case for many of you as well. Um, so that's why I'm very excited for tonight. It does look like we have a good number of folks uh, who have joined us. Uh, and some names that are new to Voices for the West. So if you would, please take a minute and drop into the chat of tonight's webinar where you're joining us from geographically so we can get a, a better idea of where we're all coming from and, and uh, better get to know each other. I'm going to do so right now myself. Um, I am joining from Gunnison, Colorado, where I live. Um, Anyone else joining from Colorado or anyone where else around the country or world outside of Idaho? Just let us know in the chat where you're from. We'd love to, uh, to see where some of the folks are joining us from. Before we dive in, uh, a couple housekeeping items real quick. You will remain on mute throughout the presentations this evening. Uh, however, uh, we do welcome your questions. At the bottom of your screen, in addition to the chat, you should see a Q&A section. If a question comes to mind at, at any point dur during the course of tonight's presentations, feel free to drop it in the Q&A section and we'll get to as many of those as we can uh, toward the end of tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will soon be up on Advocates for the West YouTube channel. We are planning another Voices for the West webinar on April 27th with Friends of Cedar Mesa and Pueblo of Acoma's Historic Observation Office to discuss unique cultural resources in Utah between Bears Ears and Canyons of the Ancients National Monuments. This is an area often called the Lands Between. Let's see, where are folks joining us from? I see Twin Falls, Idaho, Salmon Stanley, Idaho, Portland. Uh, that's great to see. Looks like we have folks from all over the place. So thank you for, uh, for tuning in this evening. Um, we are very excited to learn more tonight about the Grand Salmon Source to Sea journey, uh, as well as projects like it and efforts to save rapidly dwindling, dwindling salmon populations from extinction. So to help tee up tonight's presentations, Staff Attorney Andrew Mistel is going to give us a quick overview of Advocates for the West's work uh, related to these topics. So Andrew, the floor sure. is yours. Thanks, Will. Um, my name is Andrew Missel. I'm a staff attorney at Advocates for the West. Uh, I work out of our Oregon office in uh, Portland. Um, just uh, in case you're not super familiar with Advocates, we're a public interest, nonprofit environmental law firm. We provide free legal representation to uh, uh, citizens groups, conservation groups, Native American tribes, uh, trying to preserve and protect the natural environment. Um, and we have a crack team of eight lawyers and a, a, another crack team of four people like Will who do excellent communications, fundraising, and uh, other work like that. So we are a small but mighty team. And uh, in honor of the kind of theme of tonight's um, presentation, I wanted to talk about some of our work uh, related to salmon and steelhead and specifically Idaho salmon and steelhead and also some Oregon salmon and steelhead. Um, starting from the Stibnite mine at the headwaters of the uh, <clears throat> East Fork, South Fork Salmon River. So that's, uh, I think a lot of you probably know about that, Perpetua Gold, uh, formerly known as uh, Midas Gold, uh, wants to uh, basically get some gold and also, you know, by the way, dump a bunch of crap into the East Fork, South Fork Salmon River. So we have been involved in a Clean Water Act suit against them for quite a while. We're also working, uh, because the Forest Service is is currently determining, uh, 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 is currently in a decision making process about that mining project, and we are uh, working to try to push them to do more analysis uh, 
on that. So moving sort of down the the down towards the uh, from from source to sea. Uh, we've also done some great work at Hell's Canyon. So we settled the case, I believe it was last last year, might have been late uh, 2020. Uh, again, uh, on behalf of the Nez Perce tribe uh, against Idaho Power and the state of Oregon uh, concerning uh, the uh, Hell's Canyon complex and methylmercury pollution from that affecting salmonids. Uh, so that's, that's a case uh, uh, where we obtained a really favorable settlement, it's going to force the state of Oregon to uh, uh, write some more uh, strong requirements protecting fish there from methylmercury pollution and high temperatures. Uh, so continuing to move down, uh, then that that was a case that uh, uh, Lizzie Potter from our Oregon office uh, led on. Brian Hurlbut from our Idaho office led on this next case, which uh, concerned. Uh, temperatures, high temperatures in the uh, Snake and Columbia Rivers, and Brian won a, a great case a couple of years ago in the Ninth Circuit uh, that finally forced EPA to uh, write temperature regulations uh, to try to keep temperatures down there. Uh, huge case, and it, it's already kind of having some effects on the ground. The state of Washington has already put some more stringent requirements on the Corps' dams to try to keep uh, temperatures down. Of course, the, the Corps is fighting that, but that's um, a, a huge case that Brian uh, Ryan won a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm along with Laird Lucas, our, our executive director. Uh, I'm working. I've been working on um, slightly more wonky um, a matter, which is Bonneville Power Administration's rates. So, as a lot of a lot of you know, Bonneville Power Administration is uh, responsible for paying for the costs of mitigation, enhancement, protection of fish. Um, paying for much of those costs. And uh, of course, Bonneville uh, pays for this through the money it, it makes by selling power. Uh, and so uh, we got involved in the rate making, which Bonneville does. And sort of, as, as some of you may know, Bonneville decided a few years ago that it didn't really want to spend any more money um, for fish and wildlife protection. It wanted to flatline budgets. Um, and of course, that money goes to important things like fish screens. It goes to important things like pit tagging. Uh, and of course, now in, a, in the age of nearly 10% inflation, flatlining budgets for that really means cutting funding. And so a lot of these very important programs that are giving these fish a lifeline, um, hopefully, you know, and keeping them alive so the dams can be taken out eventually, are, are being cut and underfunded. So we, we have been working to try to uh, get BPA to um, walk back that funding, uh, defunding commitment. And then finally, um, getting further down the Columbia, making a left turn at the Willamette, um, the uh, Lori Rule and Lizzie Potter in our Oregon office, um, really, I mean, it's, I would say they won, but they just continue to win this case, forcing the Army Corps of Engineers to totally uh, re- think the way that they operate these dams on the Willamette. Uh, the Willamette, uh, Chinook, and Steelhead are in really bad shape. Um, and this case is having, it's, I think it's already having on the ground effects, but in the years that come, it's going to have huge on the ground effects uh, helping those, uh, those fish survive. So we, we do work all up and down the system, all throughout the Columbia Basin. Um, and pretty much, pretty much everyone who works at Advocates, I think, does something related to these fish. So we're, uh, we're very happy to be uh, uh, sponsoring this this uh, conversation tonight. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. And in jumping to uh, the Grand Salmon next, uh, Brooke Hess is going to be the first presenter. Brooke is a science writer, professional freestyle whitewater kayaker, media whiz, and core paddler on the Grand Salmon team. She is a former USA freestyle kayak team member, recently received a master's degree in journalism with a focus on science writing. Um, after Brooke, we'll hear from Danielle Katz, who is the co-founder and director of Rivers for Change. She's the lead source to sea coordinator for the Grand Salmon campaign and has been involved with paddling or coordinating over 20 similar campaigns. And last but not least, we'll hear from Stephen Pfeiffer, uh, who is Conservation Associate at Idaho Rivers United. Stephen's work focuses on salmon and steelhead recovery, as well as clean water and fishery issues across the state. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Brooke um, and I will share our presentation. Uh, 
All right. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Will, for those wonderful introductions. So as he said, I'm Brooke Hess. I'm one of the core paddlers on the Grand Salmon team. And before I get into the details of our project, I kind of wanted to give you an idea of how important this issue is to me and why I'm so passionate about that. So to do that, I'm going to read a short excerpt from a reflection paper I wrote while working on my master's thesis, which was actually on the topic of the declining salmon populations of the Snake River Basin. Um, so, okay. I have watched the northern lights play in the sky while roasting caribou sausage over a campfire on an island in the middle of the Slave River in the Northwest Territories. I have woken up to the sound of monkeys playing in the trees above my tent on an island in the middle of the White Nile. I have kayaked past a mama black bear teaching her two cubs to fish on the Middle Fork Salmon. I have trained with the world's top athletes in Argentina, and I've stood on podiums at races in New Zealand. I have worked so hard to achieve my goals in my sport that my mom got worried, but when I achieved those goals, she was right there on the side of the river watching. I have received a marriage proposal from a young boy living in a village next to the White Nile in Uganda. He was disappointed when I politely turned him down, but he still offered to share his jackfruit with me. I have met some of my best friends in the eddies of rivers in Idaho and shared riverside picnics with them in the Patagonia region of Southern Chile. I've seen sights so beautiful I cried and I've laughed so hard I peed. All of these moments have been directly related to rivers. Rivers have gifted me with some of the happiest experiences of my life. And in return, I would like to gift something back. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so before the details of the project, I'm just gonna give you a quick background on salmon in general. So in several studies conducted in the early 2000s by Tom Reimchan, Salmon DNA was actually found in the yearly growth rings of ancient trees adjacent to rivers in North America. So how this happens is that Snake River salmon hatch in the cold mountain streams of Idaho. The smolts, which are salmon that are in the stage of life where they're ready to go to sea, they then migrate through the Snake River and the Columbia River all the way to the Pacific Ocean where they spend the majority of their lives. And then when these salmon are ready to spawn or reproduce, they make their way back upstream through the Columbia, through the snake, and eventually to the cold mountain streams of Idaho where they hatched. And when this happens, bears and other predators line the banks of these rivers during the salmon run, hoping to take advantage of these spawning salmon for some food. So the bears then catch the salmon and bring them into the forest for a feast. And in high salmon return years, bears will be pretty picky with their food and they'll eat just the heads of the salmon and leave the carcasses in the forest to decompose. So these fish carcasses that are in the forest then become host to maggots and other forest dwelling insects, which feed on and grow in the flesh of the fish. And then once these fish or these insects are mature enough to fly, they disperse throughout the forest. And so they bring with them the nutrients gathered from the decomposing salmon. So the dispersed insects combined with the decomposing carcasses scattered throughout the forest floor provide the trees and plant life with nutrients brought all the way from the Pacific Ocean. So the salmon are a transportation mechanism for ocean nutrients and they're basically the lifeblood of the entire forest ecosystem. So the trees lining the riverbanks are literally made of salmon and thus it's super imperative that we protect salmon in order to protect the entire riparian ecosystem. So this slide details the declines in Snake River Basin salmon populations. Stephen will go into much greater detail on this later on, but I just wanted a, you guys to have a general understanding of why we're doing this. So here are some statistics that I just found, I found quite shocking. If you look at the spring summer Chinook numbers, the recovery goal is to get to 127,000 wild adults returning each season. Last year, there were around 7,000. And then for sockeye, the goal is to get to 9,000 wild adults returning each year to the Stanley Basin. Last year, there were four. So, and then if we add on to this, the fact that climate change models are predicting an increase in intensity and frequency of heat waves and drought, this has the potential to further reduce the survival of salmon at all life stages, which would only compound the dam related stressors in the Snake River Basin. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so here are the problems that scientists and conservationists point to regarding the salmon populations of the Snake River Basin, the four lower Snake River dams, and the proposal of the of reopening the Stibnite Gold Project, which is at the headwaters of the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon in Yellow Pine, Idaho. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the Grand Salmon Mission. So we are four women paddling the Salmon River from the source to the sea as a conservation project promoting the removal of the four lower Snake River dams and a moratorium on the Stibnite Gold Project. The ultimate goal is to save Idaho's rapidly dwindling salmon populations from extinction. So we're going to ski and paddle over 1,000 miles from the sources of the main, the middle, and the south forks of the salmon all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And our journey is going to be following the natural migration that anadromous salmon go on as they make their way out to sea. We will be making a film about the journey and the film will highlight the salmon populations, the communities most impacted by the declining salmon populations and the necessity to breach the dams for salmon recovery. And we're going to be using our journey down the river as a catalyst to tell this story of the Snake River Basin salmon populations. We will also be doing quite a bit of grassroots activism along the way by hosting community events such as like group paddling days, tribal visits, environmental ed education, letter writing days so people can write letters to their representatives, fly fishing clinics and all that stuff. Um, basically, we want to bring attention to this issue and we want to inspire people to call and write their representatives and tell them to take the dams out. Next slide. Okay, so this is our squad. Um, these are all the core paddlers. And one of the coolest things about our paddling team, I mean, there are many cool things. It's such a strong team. But one of the coolest teams is that we all identify as women, which I think is rad. And we all have academic backgrounds in science. So we're all bringing some sort of scientific perspective to this project and to the film. Um, together, we have backgrounds in geology, fluvial geomorphology, salmon fisheries biology, and climate change science. So I think that's really neat that we're bringing all of those perspectives. Um, and then in addition to the core paddlers, our team encompasses a whole slew of volunteers and partners who have been helpful beyond words with everything from logistics to permitting to policy direction to social media, to shuttle drivers, to film consulting, art donations, everything. Uh, we have a super strong team of volunteers who we are extremely grateful for, and we wouldn't be able to do any of this well without them. Um, in particular, Danielle, who is actually going to be speaking next. Um, Danielle is our queen, and she is amazing. And None of this would be happening without her and without Rivers for Change and Idaho Rivers United, which are two lead nonprofit partners. Next slide. Okay, so the journey. So we, on April 27th and April 28th, we will be exploring the headwaters of the Middle Fork Salmon by ski hopefully, snowpack dependent, obviously, um, but the goal there will be to reach what we believe to be the true headwaters of the middle fork of the salmon, so the peak where the water is coming from. We will then officially launch on Marsh Creek on April 29th, where we'll, hope we'll be hoping to reach the middle fork by May 1st for our permit date on the middle fork. So then after paddling the middle fork, we will be shuttled back to Stanley, Idaho, where we will ski the headwaters of the main salmon, snowpack dependent again. Um, and then we'll paddle the upper main down to Corn Creek for our main salmon permit, which is on May 20th. Then after the main, we will shuttle back to McCall, Idaho, where we'll host an event. And then we will visit the Stibnite mine near Yellow Pine, Idaho before skiing and then paddling the east fork of the south fork of the salmon into the south fork salmon and again into the main salmon. And then from there, the whole team will continue downstream through the lower salmon and into the Snake River. And on the Snake River, we will portage 
or possibly be let through the locks of the dams, but most likely portage the four dams on the lower Snake River, which is going to be a big slog fest because our kayaks are 18 feet long and we will have a lot of gear in them and there aren't exactly trails to portage. Um, so that's going to be hard. But then eventually we'll reach the confluence with the Columbia where we have four more dams to portage. And finally, we will end up in the ocean at Astoria, Oregon around mid-July is our expected finish date where we will have a big wrap-up event. So along the route, we're hosting all these events. We have one in Ketchum, Idaho, Salmon, McCall, Lewiston, Tri-Cities, Hood River, Portland, and Astoria. And we have an amazing amount of local community members and nonprofit partners who are working on these events. We have everything from community paddles and flotillas to fly fishing clinics, to diversity clinics, to advocacy trainings, letter writing projects, music, food, Basically, it's going to be really great. <laughs> and um, if you want to attend or get involved, you can check out our website for details on all the events. If you go to the next slide, we have information for how to get involved. There we go. So here's all our website and social media information, um, tax deductible donations to Idaho Rivers United, which will fund this project and the film can be made on our website. And if you want to take action for salmon right now, I suggest you fill out the survey that's at the bottom of this screen, um, but I'll also put the link in the chat. Um, I suggest waiting to fill it out until after you hear Steven's presentation because that will give you quite a bit more information to use to fill out the survey. Um, but you can also visit Idaho Reviews United website for more information for the survey, but that's something you, you can do right now if you want to. Okay, on to Danielle. All right, uh, thanks Brooke uh, for the kind words and the amazing intro. I don't know about you all, but I'm pretty stoked about hearing. I've been working with uh, planning this and it's still hearing it for the first time. It's like, whoa, this is a pretty epic, <laughs> epic adventure. Um, so I'm Danielle Katz. I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from uh, coastal Miwok land in the Lagunitas Creek watershed, which flows into Tamales Bay, which is one of the marine protected areas of Point Reyes National Seashore, which was discussed in last, uh, last month's Advocates for the West uh, webinar. And I'm the co-founder and director of Rivers for Change, which works to connect people to rivers through source to sea adventures, conservation, and education. So I want to take a moment to, uh, not next slide yet, um, is to ask you guys some, some questions and feel free to put in the chat here. Um, I think Brooke did an amazing overview um, to answer some of these questions, but what does source to see mean to you? Um, when you think of source to see, what, what sort of comes to mind um, for you? Um, and then what does source to see thinking mean? How do you, how do you think about source to see? Um, and then what is source to see literacy? So what does it mean to be source to see literate? And I pose these questions because this goal of creating communities that are source to see literate is really at the heart of these programs that we're doing both at Rivers for Change and with these source to see adventures. So it's, you know, a source to see, it starts somewhere, it ends somewhere. Does it really end somewhere? Because then the water evaporates with the water cycle and comes back to the beginning, right? We're all interconnected. Um, but, you know, where's the source? Where's the sea? Maybe it's an inland sea that something, something ends in. Um, but really, what's what's the length of this river, this water um, waterway near near you? And then, what is the source to see thinking? So, how can we really think a little bit more about how this water plays a role in our life? Right? Brooke described so well, you know, how the salmon are migrating up and down the rivers. Um, well, how does water, how they use that water? How do we use the water with our within our lives? Right? 
for our clothes, for our food? How can we become more source to see, um, you know, aware as we look at all the things that we use that use water? And then what is source to see literacy is really this next step of um, active engagement within your communities, right? So how can we really um, think about this interconnectedness and this interdependence and take knowledge, take this knowledge and engage with our communities in active campaigns, which is what the Grand Salmon Source to See is really, really trying to do. So next slide, please. So Source to See is really about connecting the drops. Um, I first became obsessed with Source to Seas in 2009 when I paddled um, 2,300 miles down the Mississippi River. And I grew up on rivers. I'd been exposed to rivers my entire life. I loved them for all the reasons we love rivers. And yet I had never been able to fully understand this idea of just how much a river changes from its source on its way to the sea. And this visceral experience of actually paddling the river and witnessing that change was life-changing, right? It starts in these pristine headwaters. Um, the team, right, is gonna be in some of the most pristine habitat of the Western United States, right? This is why we're fighting so hard. It's opening up this pristine habitat for salmon um, that exists. And, but the river changes, right? As you go downstream and they'll be passing these dams and they'll be going by barge traffic and they'll be seeing industry along the way, right? These rivers really work for us um, in, in so many ways. So watching how this changes and using adventure as a way to travel a long distance um, really led to this idea of how can we connect more people to the rivers so that they can have these visceral experiences. And adventure is one of them, right? So how, as we, you know, as I paddled for three and a half months, there were a lot of things that came up um, in my, it's a long, it's a long time to be able to think about something. So seeing that these communities along the river were disconnected from the river, they weren't actually interacting with the river that was in their own backyard. And they were disconnected from each other, right? The upstream communities aren't really necessarily talking to the downstream communities. Um, it's, a, it's hard to connect the drops that, you know, pig farmers in Iowa, um, the sludge from those farms is impacting the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so again, how can we connect, connect these drops from, from source to sea? Um, and it's really this idea of connecting people to rivers, the people to people, and then rivers to rivers within this holistic view. Um, next slide, please. So one of the ways we do that, and Brooke talked about this really well, is there's so many opportunities to engage communities and people along the way. So there's these community paddles, um, there's opportunities for cleanups, there's citizen science, right? Our team's gonna be collecting um, water sample um, samples along the way. And then there's this component of an educational adventure, right? The, this team isn't just going out to do an adventure, they're going out to engage these communities in education and also learn more themselves along the way. Um, and, as we, as we go downstream and connect more communities, you know, it's sort of like this cascade effect, right? So all of a sudden you start somewhere and a community goes, oh my God, you're traveling all the way down there? I didn't even know Astoria was like at the sea of this river that I am here up in Idaho, right? And then you get to Astoria and they're like, oh my God, you, you started all the way up in Idaho? I didn't even know that's where the river, you know, started. Um, so it's really cool to see that happen and these, these events and these um, opportunities for engagement um, are, are something that we really, we really look forward to um, during these adventures. So next slide, please. 
Um, so Rivers for Change has um, a bunch of different programs. Um, Source to Seas being one of the main ones. So we actually, when we founded in 2012, our first campaign was to paddle 12 river, 12 critical California rivers in 2012. So it was a rather ambitious um, project, but we partnered with local organizations on the ground. And that's what I love um, about this project is we're partnering with Idaho Rivers United, who is our local advocacy organization, keeping us up to date all our partner event nonprofits, they are on the ground doing the work. And we are then able to come in and use this sort of exciting adventure as a way to engage more constituents, right? And we do that through these different sort of ambassadors, right? Um, Brooke and the team um, are these, you know, athlete and community ambassadors who are going along the river, um, increasing the source to see liter literacy. Um, we also have some programs where we're working to train guides so that they can increase their um, their clientele's knowledge of the source to see literacy and really turning the adventure um, into more than just an adventure, really paddling for a purpose and, and paddling for a cause and using storytelling um, as a way to capture people's imaginations. Um, there's other, you know, athlete ambassadors. We have a kayaker who's about to paddle um, from the San Francisco Bay across to Hawaii. Uh, we have some grantees. We have a very small micro grantee program where um, we're supporting some local organization in India working on um, education and waste. And uh, we've supported, um, Haley Stewart in the past, who was working to fight dams in Bolivia and create a short film about that. So there's a lot of programs and there's a lot of ways to get engaged with all of that. And so next slide, please. What I'd really like to ask all of you is how do you want to get engaged with your backyard river or your backyard stream? Um, you don't have to be a paddler. To connect, you can go for a hike, take your dog for a walk, just make sure to pick up their poop. Um, you can have a picnic on the banks of the river. Um, but who really lives upstream of you? Who really lives downstream of you? And when you turn on your faucet, what river comes out of that faucet? Um, and where does that water go? And as you can start integrating more of that into your thinking and discussing more of that with your communities, um, it really provides this, this opportunity for change. And this visceral connection too, right? It's so important, especially in this day and age when we're on um, computers so much, right? The health and well being, the disconnection we have from nature, um, connecting with your water source and with your rivers is this amazing opportunity. Um, you know, to count to help counteract that. And you've all heard that argument of when you fall in love with the place, right, you're that much more likely to protect it. And so getting out doing these adventures, falling in love with this place, and then really wanting to fight for them. So next slide, please. So, um, yeah, Connect the drops in your life. You can visit us at riversforchange.org. Um, follow us on all the socials, but really encourage you to um, volunteer, spread the word, engage, take action. Um, we'll be putting more links in the chat about ways to do that. Um, but there are links on all of our, all three of our organizations' websites um, of really how how to take action and get involved with that. So. Um, Thank you so much. And I will turn it over to Stephen. Okay, yeah, thank you, Danielle. Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, yeah, my name is Stephen Pfeiffer, uh, he, him pronouns. I work at Idaho Rivers United. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Idaho Rivers United is a statewide conservation group um, and we're committed to protecting our rivers and wild fish. Um, we've been doing so for over 30 years. Um, I am just going to talk a bit about um, what would it take to replace the Lower Snake River dams and um, where our salmon are currently. Um, if you go to the next slide. 
So um, Brooke touched on this a little bit already, but um, you know, the current status of Snake River salmon is not good. Um, all populations are actually trending towards extinction um, and have been doing so ever since the lower Snake River dams were put in place uh, in the 60s and early 70s. Um, the important takeaway from these graphs would be looking at that recovery number, um, which is informed from 1950s levels of abundance. Um, you can see that we had upwards of 100,000 Chinook and steelhead in our streams in Idaho, um, which provided a healthy and harvestable fishery um, back in the 50s. And of course, today um, we're under 10,000 fish uh, in the case of Chinook. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about um, the Lower Snake River dams, when they are breached, um, you know, before that happens, the services they provide must be replaced. Um, I'm going to go over a few different sectors and show what regional investments um, in the Northwest would achieve. Um, when we look at shipping, first of all, the dams are used as a navigation corridor um, to ship federally subsidized grain um, in barges. And that would need to be replaced. Fortunately, the rail line is already in place along much of the river. Um, investments in expanding and updating that line, as well as the lower snake of reports and grain storage infrastructure would be need, needed to be made, but um, that is all very realistic and doable. Um, of course, when you just have one mode of transport for farmers to uh, ship their grain down river, it's important to maintain um, competitive affordable rates, um, which could be done through an endowment or suitable appropriations of some kind. Um, so I think it's really important um, when you look at the shipping piece that, um, you know, through federal investment, we can ensure that our agricultural stakeholders um, can create tailor-made solutions that work for them. Next slide, please. So when we look at the energy piece, um, the four Lower Snake River dams produce just under a thousand megawatts. Um, of yearly energy, which is about 4% of the regional generation. So a pretty modest amount of energy in the grand scheme of things. Um, and the important thing to think about is that that energy is highly seasonal. Um, the dams are run of river, which means that they generate the most power when the river is flowing the highest, which of course occurs when all the snow melts in the spring. Um, however, the highest demand in the region occurs in the summer and the winter when folks are turning on their AC units and their heating units. Um, so these dams are not very critical to grid stability when demand is highest. Um, in terms of their replacement, you know, a mix of clean energy resources, um, wind, turbines, solar, batteries, uh, demand response measures um, can easier, easily replace this power generation. Um, and are in fact rapidly being developed already uh, across the region. Um, you know, renewable energy is becoming cheaper and cheaper each year um, and will actually increase grid reliability in the future um, as climate change makes river lowers level, especially river levels lower, especially in the summer um, when that energy is needed most. Uh, next slide. And so a third piece to look at um, is irrigation. There is irrigation. Um, much of the farming uh, in eastern Washington, eastern Washington and Idaho is dry land, but there is irrigation mainly concentrated around Ice Harbor Dam. Um, and that is pretty straightforward. The, you know, irrigators would receive funding to reconfigure their pipes and intake systems to adapt to a lower river, um, a lower free flowing river. Uh, Next slide. And so will it work? Well, you know, on my first slide when I was talking about um, the state of salmon and steelhead, uh, one metric I didn't touch on was what we know as the smolt to adult ratio or SAR. And that's basically measuring how many adult fish come back for every 100 juvenile fish that migrate out to the ocean. And regional goals say two to 6%, two to six adult fish for every 100 juveniles have to come back um, to have a stable, and when you get to the upper part of that range, increase in population. Right now, 
um, all Snake River salmon and steelhead populations are right around 1% or below, which is where we get that trend from extinction. Um, however, when you look at salmon populations in the mid-Columbia, where they only have to go over three or four dams, um, we're talking about Yakima, Deschutes, John Day, those tributaries, their small to adult return ratios are three to four percent, well within the stable population range, and in fact, in some cases, growing. Um, so that is a huge piece of why dam removal is the most effective recovery action, and really the only recovery action we can take if we want snake river fish back. Um, and then, you know, I would allude to dam removals that have already happened, which in this case, the picture we're looking at is the Elwha River in Washington. And, you know, we're seeing the restoration process play out. Um, you know, it's not a quick, a quick process by any means. Uh, salmon recovery happens over generations. River restoration, you know, takes on multiple phases and happens over a long time. But, you know, amazing things have already happened on the Elwha. Uh, summer steelhead were considered practically extirpated from that river, and they're recolonizing the upper stretches ever since those two dams were removed, and um, Chinook and other species of salmon are rebounding as well. So, you know, to quote Congressman Mike Simpson, um, salmon need one thing, they need a river. And right now what they have is a series of reservoirs um, that goes all the way from the Idaho border down to the Columbia. Um, so, you know, there is hope, and um, continue to look at those dam removal examples um, and hope that we can um, push forward legislation that recommends dam removal in the near future. Thank you, guys. All right, let me. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Brooke, Danielle, and Stephen, for such informative, hiring presentations. And thank you, Andrew, for uh, the overview of how Advocates for the West is involved in these issues. Um, as a reminder to everyone, um, if you have any questions uh, that uh, came to mind over the course of the presentations that you'd like to know some more information about, um, or uh, perhaps you're just curious about uh, how you can get involved, um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat, or I'm sorry, in the Q&A function um, of tonight's webinar, um, and we will take about the next 10 or so minutes, uh, maybe a few more, um, to, to field some of those questions. So um, with that, um, I do have a question myself. Um, uh, to kind of kick things off here, and that is um, how the team of paddlers is preparing, how are you training, how are you ready from a logistics standpoint for such, uh, you know, a long and arduous thousand plus mile journey? What, what all is taking place behind the scenes? Oh my goodness, that's a great question. And a pretty big question. And I think every team member would have a different answer. Um, the way I'm training is by eating a lot because I feel like a thousand miles of paddling, I'm gonna lose a lot of weight. So I'm trying to eat like 3000 plus calories a day. Um, I'm also strength training obviously in the gym and kayaking and all those normal things. Um, Danielle is mastering our logistics. Libby is <laughs> writing her master's thesis right now. And I think she's gonna defend maybe like four days before we launch. Um, Ali is working full-time and doing logistics. Um, Haley's managing a career as a professional artist. Like we're all doing different things um, and we're all training in our own way. Um, Danielle, do you have more to say about how we're preparing? A lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> oh my God. We have like 30 <laughs> spreadsheets. I never thought kayaking would ever include this many spreadsheets. It's ridiculous. All right. Well, well, that is awesome. Thank you both uh, so much for offering some of the, the color there of, uh, of what's taking place. Um, here's, here's perhaps a good one to provide a little bit of background. Um, and I will, um, Stephen, I'm not sure if you want to take this or, or perhaps someone else wants to jump in. Uh, the question is, don't the dams have fish ladders? 
Why um, are these not working for the fish to return to spawn? Yes, yeah. So all the dams um, on the Lower Snake and then the four on the Lower Columbia are passable by fish. Um, the issue is that the um, rate of mortality is so high from the cumulative experience of passing through eight dams, particularly for juvenile fish heading out to the ocean. Um, it's less so an issue for adult fish, although there are hot water concerns with the reservoirs um, for long and hot temperatures in the summer. But um, the real mortality issues occur um, as juvenile fish um, float down the river to the ocean and have to pass through eight dams where there is, you know, degraded river conditions, um, invasive predators, and, um, you know, the cumulative stress that occurs passing through um, those structures and um, really reduces their fitness when they hit the estuary and subsequent life stages. Um, you see the um, declining returns through all of those. Okay, thank you for that, Stephen. Um, this question has to do with the the selection of the route, which I'm sure was was very uh, intentional, given um, some of the uh, the factors that went into this um, around storytelling, around you know partnerships with with um, uh, community organizations and whatnot. Um, why for this project uh, did you uh, choose the route that you did? Um, and to piggyback on that a little bit, why didn't you travel from the headwaters of one of the tributaries to the main salmon or the headwaters of the main salmon itself and paddle all the way to the sea from the source instead of doing different ones and shuttling in between them by other conveyances? Yeah, that's a really good question. We thought a lot about this and basically we wanted to like when it came down to it, we wanted to encompass the whole watershed in this story. And we were actually originally thinking maybe we would include the Clearwater and the Selway as well, like those watersheds as well. But then the project was getting way too big and we got stressed and we were like, no, just the salmon, but all of the tributaries of the salmon, because we really want to focus on the fact that all these tributaries are affected and all of these headwaters are affected. And we really wanted to point to the Stibnite mine, which is on the East Fork of the South Fork of the Salmon. That's a really important part of this project is to try and stop the Stibnite mine because everything that happens at the Stibnite mine also happens downstream of the Stibnite mine. So that affects everything in the whole watershed. And then there's just, there's just so much, so much importance on the main salmon and the Middle Fork. Like Middle Fork is such an iconic river. We couldn't not paddle the Middle Fork. And then the main like Redfish Lake is such an important headwaters and so famous that we wanted to include all of it. And I also think we're just overachievers. But I also recognize that um, by shuttling ourselves back up, we have more of a carbon footprint. So with that, no project is perfect. And we do recognize that. And we're looking for an electric vehicle sponsorship if anyone knows of any, because <laughs> that would be helpful. Does that pretty well cover it? Danielle, anything you want to add to that? I just want to give you an opportunity here. You do have. I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah, it's really that that Stibnet mine thing. I think it it doesn't make sense for us to work to breach the dams, have the dams breached, and then have a mine put in at the most pristine headwaters um, that exist for these salmon to spawn in. Um, so again, really connecting all those drops that we can possibly within, um, within this project. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a question here that I will expand upon a little bit. The question is, um, so how can we uh, support uh, Congressman Simpson? And perhaps I will, will expand upon that a little bit by asking relatedly, where are our regional elected leaders on this project, say, other than, than Congressman Simpson, and what can people do to have an impact? How, how can you act if you really want to, uh, to have an, a, an effect on this issue and, and really make an impact? Who wants to field that one? Yeah, I can, I can start and then others can, can hop in if they want. Um, yeah, so I mean, the best way, you know, for those that don't know, Congressman Simpson about a year ago came out with an extensive framework of 
what investment would look like in the region to one, breach the dams, but also um, build out all of those infrastructure and renewable energy services that I touched on um, in the wake of the dams not being there. Um, and so he is really the strongest app salmon advocate we have in Congress right now. Um, so to support him, I think there's two things. There's two fronts, um, one being heavily engaged with Washington representatives right now. Um, Governor Jay Inslee and Senator Patty Murray um, have a process where they are examining how to replace those Lower Snake River Dam services in the event of breach. Um, and the deadline for the end of their report will be uh, late July. Um, they'll have a draft report coming out in May, mid-May, I believe. Um, so engaging heavily with that process. Um, right now, that link that Brooke shared in her presentation um, is to a survey that is open to anyone, not just Washington residents. Um, and it's asking, you know, how, how would they go about replacing the services of the dams? Um, why is it important to remove the dams? Um, you can touch on the importance of salmon recovery, all of that. And so that's step one. And then later on in the spring, engaging with this draft report and making sure that we have a lot of good support for salmon on that um, and being heavily involved with that process. And then concurrently on the federal side of things, um, the Biden administration is engaged in a similar process um, looking at salmon recovery in the region, um, i.e. looking at the dams. Um, and so I saw in the chat, um, I think Dave dropped it in the chat, but the, the federal arm where the public can interact with the government um, right now is the Council on Environmental Quality um, and their chair, Brenda Mallory. So that is a key specific target that you can reach out to. Um, they just put out a press release detailing um, how you can reach out. And um, I don't have the email on the top of my head, but there's a specific email that you can reach her at. Um, and then other targets such as um, Deb Holland um, and um, others in the Army Corps. So there's kind of the federal process and then there's the process within Washington. Um, and both of those um, will help amplify Simpson's message, message from a year ago. And I would just add, I agree with everything Stephen just said. I would add one additional thing. Um, there's a good chance if you live in the Pacific Northwest, you, uh, you are served by a public utility. Um, and public utilities are run by people who are elected by the customers of that utility. Uh, right now, the public utilities are in starting negotiations with Bonneville Power Administration for long-term, like 20-year contracts. They're going to come up for uh, in like 2028. Um, you know, a couple of, uh, we've had some real salmon advocates actually get elected to a couple of those PUDs and really they can, you can really put pressure on Bonneville. Bonneville is not in a great financial situation and those, the PUDs, especially the bigger ones, but even just some of the smaller ones working in, in uh, conjunction with one another can really put pressure on them. I, I'm not, you know, suggesting that you want to go be a, a, a PUD commissioner because that's a, I'm not, I'm not sure it's the most fun job in the world, but um, you can definitely go to those meetings. You can put pressure on them. They're, they're a lot, I think, more responsive than a lot of other officials because they have a much smaller constituency. And frankly, they're not used to hearing, they're not used to getting pressure put on them as much as, you know, a senator or, or representative at the federal level. So I would say get, find out if you live uh, somewhere and served by a public utility district and uh, or, or other public utility, you know, it's the city of Seattle, city of and uh, Tacoma, and um, and you can pressure them. Okay, um, we have time for one more question this evening, and I see a couple similar ones that have appeared in the chat. I know that uh, Brooke did mention um, that electric vehicle sponsorship is one thing you guys are, are looking for. Um, I, I think it would be great if you could kind of, you know, speak to some of those other things, um, if in fact you are looking for some additional assistance. So I'm going to combine these two questions. The first is, what kind of support is the source to see teams still looking for? Sponsorships, partnerships, donations? Do you need assistance with kayak shuttles? What can you tell us? Uh, yes to all, <laughs> all of the above. Um, 
yeah, I mean, it, this project is gaining momentum and it will only continue, but it, it does take a village of volunteers, of sponsors, of partners for events, of um, all of that. So we have some Google Forms on our website with the source salmonsourcesea.com get involved. So there's ways if you'd like to volunteer and help with the shuttle, put your info in there. Uh, if you want to host the paddlers as they pass through and give them a shower, if you want to show up at the shore someplace with um, some gluten-free, dairy-free pizza for Brooke, um, <laughs> uh, that's all really helpful. Right now, we're working a lot on um, a silent auction, trying to work on um, partnerships with artists who are specifically doing things with rivers and salmon. So we're collecting more art items um, and just general swag. Um, for that silent auction. Donations are always welcome. Any, any shape and size really does um, help move this campaign forward. Um, and then larger sponsorships, you know, um, small businesses as well. We have amazing small businesses all the way along who are, who are reaching out. Um, and it's really an awesome opportunity um, to engage um, with promotion for your local business to give back to an important cause. Um, so yeah, we appreciate any and all of that involvement. I'll also add, we are making our own swag, which will have our um, logo on it, the Grand Salmon logo that you've seen in our presentation. Um, we will have shirts and hats for sale at all the events and on the NRS website. NRS is one of the sponsors of this trip. So watch out for those. I think they're going to be pretty cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for such thought-provoking questions. And thank you, Brooke, Danielle, and Stephen, for your insights. Um, you know, I'll say the important work that groups like Advocates for the West and Idaho Rivers United and Rivers for Change and projects like the Grand Salmon Source to Sea Journey um this work is all possible thanks to the generosity of supporters like you who are with us tonight if you do feel inspired this evening we hope that you will give a gift to one or more of our organizations to help us continue this work uh, we will be sending a follow-up email to attendees including a link to the recording of the webinar on youtube please feel free to share it far and wide with folks who you think might be interested in our work and as a reminder, we will have another Voices for the West uh, webinar on April 27th, focused on the lands between, where Advocates for the West has an active case over Trump era oil and gas lease sales, in which the Bureau of Land Management failed to adequately consult with tribes or ensure protection of cultural resources. So stay tuned for more on that. And with that, I hope that everyone has a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone.